no one's going to see And also then I have to go like this to the mic. Oh, because oh, yeah. four inches taller. <laughs> um, so I'm just like, mm, that doesn't seem like a good plan. I'll go yes. ask the guy, but I'm pretty sure he'll be like, please, don't walk around. Because <laughs> walking fair. around and moving my arms a lot when I talk is my jam. So I'll I get just, you. I'll just move my arms more. Okay. Can we put that on like the back or? Yeah, yeah. If that works, then I'm cool. Okay. Oh, sure. Um, okay. That's awesome. Actually, what I'll do, I'll bring it around the back here. Okay. Is it tape for my skin or my dress? Because you can tape the dress, but I'm... It's just for the, it's just for the uh, cable. Oh, oh, no, no, but I mean um, you're going to tape it to my dress? Uh, can you... Can you... Just, yes, I will, yes. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Good. Okay. No, no, I just, um, I get a rash with glue oh, sometimes. Sure. So the dress is cool, but the skin is less cool. I got you. Perfect. Yeah, is that... They've asked me... Okay. They've asked everyone... They've asked everyone to wear masks, and so I want to be like the well-behaved example. Am I on? Uh, I, I am on with sounds, perfect. I am making sounds and doing the things. I tend to project quite a bit once I'm in front of the stage because I get excited, and also I move my arms a lot. Okay. And I like to walk around a lot, so thank okay. you so much for providing a lot. Okay. I will. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Aha! Laugh, Mike. We have you touch you. Now I am allowed moving around. Now, now you can wander so, all so, so Now I'm like tempted to put my shoes back on because they're really cute. But they're pretty, they're wobbly, but they're so cute. Would you mind taking a picture of me when I'm doing short plan. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us at the Tiana Initiative uh, 2023 here at the Westin. To go over Diana Initiative, uh, our mission, honestly, is to create a more inclusive um, information security industry. It sounds simple, but it takes everybody's little bit to help and make everyone get, have a place to feel here, have a place in security. Everyone belongs, and that's why we're here to help expand and grow. Our theme this year is lead the change. Uh, this, our logo here, which you're gonna see spattered across all of like our signs and such, is basically our, our hero. She's sitting in front of a screen of kind of going into that deep rabbit hole of finding those things, helping the people, making a change, and then helping lead the way there. It's part of hope, wonderment, and, and leadership. Uh, our theme, we hold a theme contest every year. Uh, our theme this year for Lead the Change was actually submitted by Asana Sahani. My apologies if I said your name incorrectly. Uh, but she submitted it, and um, we all voted on it. So this is your theme. Uh, we will be doing another theme contest. So keep in mind if you have ideas for something for next year, when we open up that uh, thing, come on out, give us your idea, and your theme could be next year's. Just a little housekeeping items here. Masks are required unless you're actively eating or drinking uh, or if speakers are presenting. 
Uh, we do ask if you do um, get COVID during the event, please email COVID at Diana Initiative. What tracks, villages, kind of locations you were, we wanna keep statistics. We wanna let everyone know and we want to try to help if they're like, hey, I was in the career village or hey, I was, you know, in track one. So we can kind of let you know, we will make announcements saying, hey, we'll put it out on our socials. You know, someone tested positive around this time, you know, as best as you can get. Uh, we want to be proactive. We want to keep those numbers so that we can tell, you know, keep everyone safe. Um, badges. Um, there are some tickets uh, or the tickets and badges on the swag desk. Uh, we do have, um, give or take, now this may have changed since this morning, uh, 20 arcade badges, blinky badges from last year. You can play Space Invaders on them. It is very entertaining. Uh, we also have uh, 20 of the Pod BYO SAOs. Um, and then we also have a leak contest. So to win a rare, rare leet badge, you must solve the quote on the back of your badges that you, had this, you got this morning. There's a quote, you must solve that. In order to solve that, once you solve it, Head on over to Maker Village. Chris over there, who's gonna be leading it, go up to her and let her know, hey, I solved it. And then let her know what it is and then you'll get yourself a lead badge. Uh, here's just kind of a layout. Our first floor, we do have two uh, rooms that are for our workshops. It's Mesquite One and Two. Mesquite One, we have Black Hoodie for the uh, reverse engineering workshop. And then we have JPMC workshops in that second one there. And it's just right there to the right of the check-in desk for you. And then kind of give you orientations there. Uh, and then kind of here's an idea. So uh, Black Hoodie will be doing that reverse engineering workshop for women from 9 to uh, 6 p.m. down there. Uh, the introduction to active directory exploitation. It'll be a hands-on lab from 10 to noon. And then after the ARR, turning lessons learned into actions, that's from 2 to 3.30. And that'll be in the JPMC one at Mesquite 2 for you. Here we are on the second floor. We're all the way over here in track one. Uh, but, but over here, down just to my left, right through this room over here is track two. Uh, you've walked by Maker Village, the career fair. We do have an adv adversary adventure game in the career fair. Go play. It's a very kind of a choose the direction you want to go and it's kind of an interactive thing to kind of have that adversary how do you beat it how do you think go to go see them it's really really fun uh, we do have track three and then lockpick village uh, and across the way over is career village where you can go talk do uh, resume reviews possibly some mock interviews you know kind of get yourself prepped ready to go any kind of questions you have they're there to help you for it um, then we also have, uh, if you ever need to see us, we are actually not in the staff room. That's gotten moved. Uh, we're in the little tiny room over here uh, next to the meals. So if you have questions, you're lost, you need something, you're not quite sure where to go, come find us. We're all running around in this shirt. Like, we're, if you see someone in this shirt, we're here to help you. Um, if you need anything at all, come find us. Uh, if you're close to that area and you have a question, stop by. Anyone there can help you out. Uh, we do have actually in that staff room kind of floating around throughout the day is we're going to have kind of our neurodivergent uh, it was a workshop but now it's kind of more of a like one-on-one -on -one session if you had questions concerns that sort of thing mandy's here today she's going to be hanging out there come and join her like talk have conversations she's going to be hanging out in the well what we label staff room uh, it'll be the boardroom there it'll have a table uh, there right next to reg come hang out and this is mandy
uh, second floor, kind of just gave you an overview of what I told you here. Basically, your talk tracks, your maker village, lock picking village, the go see the adventure, uh, adversary adventure game. Uh, registration, and if you did get a meal tab, it's over um, by the staff room. Uh, and meals are only if you did purchase them, uh, and or staff speakers or volunteers. So if you did not, unfortunately, um, they are just for those individuals. Uh, there is uh, options downstairs that you can go in, like, like there's a Starbucks and a restaurant, that sort of thing, if you wanted as well. And this will be the after hours, this will be our social. So the food room was actually going to be our social room. So come join us uh, in our socials kind of after the fact to give you an idea of what we got going on. We got from eight to 10, we are going to have like cyber trivia. Uh, there's gonna be some D&D, &D, some board games, some logo or some Legos and hands-on crafts. So come on, come on back after dinner and come hang out. Uh, and thank you to our sponsors. Honestly, we couldn't do this without any of them. Um, our diamond sponsors this year are JP Morgan and Chase. Uh, Problem is going to be Amazon. Uh, gold is all of these, which you're going to see here, which is the cybersecurity of Homeland Security, um, B sides Seattle, uh, Microsoft, TikTok, uh, NBC Universal. Here's our uh, list of our rainbow sponsors, and thank you, Purple. <laughs> uh, Career Village. We have, they're, they're hanging out in our Career Village. Come see them. Um, they're also the sponsor for our, our Career Village. Uh, coffee that you're gonna be having around here, that is gonna be done by Activis Activision Blizzard. So thank them for the, ca the heavy caffeination. <laughs> uh, the lanyards that you all have on for your badges was actually um, supplied by, my, by Alyssa Miller. And the badges themselves are friends of Alyssa Miller, but yes, so Alyssa, thank Alyssa a lot for those badges. And then the DIY electronic badge kits that you can go and you can purchase as well and go actually learn to solder them together, and that's funded by TikTok. And then here is all of our super ally and in-kind donations from everyone who has helped make this organization and this event happen. And honestly, now why you're here, because you're not here to see me, you are here to see Tanya, and I'm gonna run away, and she's gonna give an amazing keynote. Awesome. Hi everyone, I'm Tanya, and I'm just gonna set up my computer. The setting up of the computer, if you don't know, is the most stressful part for every speaker. We're always like, it worked earlier, will it work now, or will it make me look dumb? It's 50-50, just so you know. <laughs> okay, let's see how this goes. Uh, so. Okay, so hopefully you're gonna start seeing that soon. Keyboard set up, nope, go away. Oh good, and then we've got this. So we don't need the keyboard set up, we are fine. Everything's gonna be okay. Okay, arrange displays. Um, so you're not seeing my display. It's kind of non-optimal. Oh, yeah, oh yeah, over here. You're right, you're right. Yes, thank you. Okay, let's see how this goes. Ideally, you're gonna see like a big screen. Yes, woohoo, the hardest part is over. Okay, awesome. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Jane, for introducing me. Let's see if this works. No, it doesn't. Okay. Um, uh, on. Okay, it's gonna go way better now. Perfect, okay. So hi, everyone, I'm Tanya. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate you being here. There's an extra seat up here in case someone wants to sit down. Also, like, standing around the edges is totally encouraged. If you're in the hallway, hi. Um, I'm Tanya, and I wanna talk about shifting security everywhere. And so I'm gonna explain what that is. There's gonna be like a couple of jokes. There may be cats. Uh, there'll be a lot of AppSec. So first of all, um, what we're gonna talk about today. So I like to tell everyone this is what we're gonna talk about, then we do it, and then later I'm like, oh, by the way, that's what we talked about. I'm one of those presenters. And so we're gonna talk about how we need more than shifting left and what the heck it is. Um, we're gonna talk about what more comprehensive 
application security looks like? Because I have a lot of people tell me all the time, what are we supposed to be doing? <laughs> um, oh, wait, wait, wait. There we go. Oh, okay. We can do this. All right. Uh, then we need developer buy-in. So we can't secure software if the software developers are not like on board with our plan. And we'll talk about how to do that. And then we're going to talk about security that works for the business. So who here has ever seen someone pet a cat backwards? That is how I see a lot of security programs for the rest of the business all day long. And the rest of the business is like, I am tolerating this. So what if instead we were nice to them? OK, so let's go. Um, so I um, theoretically, I do marketing because I write a blog. But I feel like marketing people ruin a lot of stuff. And so shift left used to, buttons, used to mean something, right? And now it seems to mean buy our product and then you are secure, and that's not what it means. So very briefly, so what, what am I talking about and what am I complaining about in this whole talk? Um, so what we wanted, what us nerds wanted, I wanted people to start security at the very first day that you would kick off a software project. There'd be a kickoff meeting, I'm like, I am your AppSec nerd, hello. I'm gonna help you the whole way through and make sure by the time you release this, it's gonna be safe and reliable. That's what we wanted. We wanted to start security earlier, as early as we could. But then it turned into like, buy our product, blah, blah, blah. If someone is telling you, oh, buy our product, and then you've shifted left, you can just ignore their advice from then on. You're good. OK, so but what I think we need is comprehensive security. And so by that, I mean we need to secure the new apps that we're making. That's super important. But we also need to secure all the apps that are already out there in prod, because those are usually the ones everyone's attacking. The brand new one you made last week with the super awesome brand new framework is by default going to be more secure because it's more modern, right? And so it's all that stuff that's already in prod. I need to secure that stuff too, even if it's less sexy. Yeah, I know, right? OK, so this is the first cat. <laughs> and also, thank you to Cat for my cat ears. Um, OK, so shifting left's not enough. We need to do more than that, and that's what we're going to talk about a lot. I want to shift security everywhere. And by that, I mean the entire system development life cycle. So that's the thing that devs do all day long to build the software. And then once it's out in prod, I want to secure that too. So how do we do that? OK, oh, so first of all, about me. So I'm that lady. So my hair is purple and red now because I couldn't make up my mind. So forgive me. <laughs> um, but um, so I just got a new job. So that was a big announcement. I got a new job this week. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, so some, some grab bought my company, We Hack Purple, and now I get to give free training to the whole world. And I'm really excited. <laughs> so thank you, thank you, thank you for them. Um, I am known as GX Purple. I wrote a book. I've been in tech a long time. I'm a giant nerd. I do some stuff, and I give some AppSec advice. But basically, I really want people to build more secure software. If you're going to take something away from this slide besides red looks nice on me, you also want to take away that like, I really care about securing software. OK, so that's enough about me. So we now know shifting left's not enough. We're like kind of like, I kind of understand what shifting left is, maybe. And it's not enough. we got to do more stuff. So, so this is the, what we're going to do for most of this presentation. We're going to talk about comprehensive security for like almost the entire time. And then briefly, we're going to talk about developer buy-in. It's going to involve being nice to them, spoiler alert. We're going to briefly talk about how we can make security work for the business. And it sounds silly, but like I put these two parts in because I don't see them very often and I want to see them more. Like the advice is going to be really obvious. Like, what if you talked to them or got feedback or like listened? Um, but I'm seeing it because I'm not seeing it. And then a conclusion of like, you can do this, we're awesome. And then there'll be a few free resources at the end. Um, books are not free, but the rest is free. OK, so what does comprehensive security look like? So comprehensive means like you've, you've covered the whole thing. So it does not mean I bought one tool and I scanned something once, and now I'm done. That's the opposite of comprehensive. It, it means we're really doing a very good job. Um, and so to me, that means it has to be during the software development lifecycle or the SDLC. Who here knows what the SDLC is? Oh, good, so many hands. So for those that don't know, it's the process that software developers follow to make software. And when they learn it in school, security is not part of it. And that sucks. Um, so I want that to change. Uh, and then after release. So once we've made the thing and we've put it out there and customers are using it or 
our employees are using it or whoever uses it and they're happy, I want that to also continue to be safe because software doesn't age well. So I like to do things like this. So I prepare for the thing I'm doing, I execute my plan, and then I have a maintenance plan so I keep doing the thing. This maintenance plan is the tricky part. It's easy to be really good at your job for one month. It's hard to keep doing it two years later. And so we're gonna talk about ways you can continue to be awesome and do a good job. So I'm gonna split it into two sections and then three sections, so six sections, and hopefully you're like, that's fine. Okay, so this is the system development lifecycle. If you do DevOps, it looks like an eternity symbol and the steps have slightly different names, but they're very similar. But basically, oh, wait, 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 back. No matter what you're doing, if you're agile, you're waterfall, you're doing some weird one that no one does, you still need to have requirements, like what am I building? You still need to design it. You still do the fun part, which is all the coding. Then there's the testing part, which some of us really love, and some of us are like, no, bad news. Uh, and then lastly, you release it, and then everyone has a party. So how can we prepare to make it secure? So one of the ways is create documentation. So if you, so I do not mean 80 page documents that no one reads. Ideally one page, ideally very concise, ideally really, really to the point and clear. And so like if you're gonna have requirements for your project, what if some of them were security requirements? This sounds obvious, right? Like 90% of the clients I work with don't do that. They're like, here's the project. And then later they're like, why didn't you do this? And the devs are like, why didn't you tell us you wanted us to do this? This sounds really obvious, right? But they're not doing it. Um, so security design review or architecture documents. Again, not 80 pages. I'm looking at past me. Um, like we wanna be concise. Um, secure coding guidelines. So if they're gonna write code, what if you told them what you wanted them to write? Like what you wanted secure code to look like? You might get it. Um, security testing guide. So if I'm gonna let someone go and test, maybe I should have some ground rules so that nothing scary happens. So we could prepare by having all these things ready. Another thing, so I looked up threats on Unsplash and I got this image and I do not love it. So if you have a better threat image, but I, like I was like, oh, it looks scary. Um, so if you're gonna do threat modeling, I like to start really lightweight. You, so I'm a big fan of, like, of threat modeling and all the books and that's cool. And yes, you can make, like, do very, very fancy, extensive threat modeling, but you don't have to. You can do really like, informal, just have a coffee and ask some questions. Is it perfect? No, no threat model is perfect. All the people that write the threat modeling books, they'll tell you they're not perfect. It's okay if you're not perfect. I'd rather you do some than none. And all of us agree on that. Um, and so ideally, I wanna just start with a one hour meeting per project and just talk and listen. Okay, and then lastly, don't start a threat modeling program or any other security program if you don't have any people to help you do it. I know that sounds really obvious, but I've heard of companies that are like, every new project's gonna have a threat model. I'm like, cool, who's doing them? They're like, that guy's gonna do them off the side of his desk for 500 projects. I'm like, that's not really happening. We all know that, right? That's not happening. So ensure you have capacity is the most important thing on this slide, and I don't love that image. Anyway, okay, so next. Um, so if you're gonna do a secure design review or an architecture review, that's awesome, cool. You should have one paradigm, like don't review them in 20 different ways. The dev should know what's coming. It should be kind of similar every time. I'm saying that because that's not what I see. Um, don't send out a 50-page questionnaire. I worked somewhere once and this guy made an 80-page questionnaire uh, and then we made a six page one and guess who got their questionnaire filled me. Um, you don't want 80 page questionnaire like these devs. I don't know if you know, they have a job other than serving my team. Um, and so it should be ideally like I love to not even have a questionnaire. I have a meeting with a whiteboard and I draw stuff and they forgive me for being very bad at drawing. And I'm like, is this encrypted? How does this guy know that that guy's our friend, etc.?" and ask silly questions. And at the end, I'm like, may I have three changes? and life is better. Okay, so next, we're still preparing. We haven't even started, we're just preparing. So the next is, I wanna give them tools, and I wanna give them training on how to use the tools so they feel smart. You do not wanna give them a tool, not show them how to use it, and then they feel dumb, they don't like the tool, they don't wanna use it, they feel frustrated, and it gets turned off. I have seen this many times, and so ideally, if you're gonna give them a tool, show them how to be little ninjas with it, and you will get better results. Um, oh, and I don't care which tool, just give them a tool. If you can give them more than one tool, that's awesome, but give them a tool, please. Okay, um, 
I like the project management team. I have discovered that if I become their friends, like I'm really big on bribery, like for instance, like donuts, bagels, cookies, <laughs> you'll notice like the carbs thread there, but if you can talk to them and say like, hey, every new project we're gonna do these things, so I need you to schedule those things into the project. Who here has written software professionally before, like where that was part of your job? Okay, so how cool is it two weeks before you go live to have someone give you like a pen test result and it's gonna take you six weeks to fix it and then your deadline's blown and you look stupid. It's not cool. Two thumbs down. What if we scheduled this stuff so they know what's coming and then their deadline's appropriate? Um, I don't wanna work all night. Even when I was 20, I didn't wanna work all night. Two thumbs down. Okay, mm, button, there we go. Um, so if you are gonna use a CI CD, you're doing DevOps, you're awesome. Figure out what can go in the CI CD but also figure out what should not go in there so that no one likes you anymore. Um, I'm gonna do a workshop this week at B-Sides about like how to put stack analysis in your CI CD without making everyone on the dev team totally hate you. <laughs> this is important. And like if, if you can't make it work so it's nice, then don't do it that way. Like still do it, but not that way. Don't put it in the CI CD, put it somewhere else. Do a different type of process. And this might sound really obvious, but I see people, they're like, the vendor said we have to do this. I'm like, tell the vendor to go away. Do the way that it works for you. Um, okay, so now we're gonna start executing. We're gonna do some stuff. So again, like I try to just check in with the project management team. They're like, oh, there's Tanya. She's coming to ask us for stuff, but she brought donuts again. She's not so bad. Um, I also like to bake cookies. Homemade cookies get you really far. Um, but basically, if I can show up to the first meeting, so my second last job as a dev, as a full-time dev, I remember we had this meeting and this woman showed up, and she's like, hi, I'm Alicia, and I'm your security human, and I'm gonna be here the entire project. I will never give up on you, and it was true, she didn't. She was so determined, it was awesome. She put up with all my crap. And then at the end, we released a secure app together. And so I wanna be that for devs. I wanna be like Alicia, who's totally still amazing and awesome, and I still admire this person. And so, I want to be there at the very beginning. So you showing them your face and being like, hi, this is the app tech face. Whatever your face looks like, it's great because you are there to help. Okay, and then on top of that, ensure that my new steps are in the schedule. So if everyone's doing a threat model, that needs to be in the schedule somewhere. If it's not in the schedule, guess what? The project managers don't go and nag them and ask them, did you do one yet? No. So I wanna be friends with the business analysts, I wanna be friends with the project managers, all those people are awesome. Oh, and don't forget to put the requirements in the project. I've seen that, that doesn't work. Okay, um, if there is a contractor that you need, so like let's say, oops, let's say you want like a pen tester, secure code review, whatever you want, if you can schedule it for them, not only one, can you pick who it is, so they're good, two, you can get like a big contract so that you are always hiring from the same company, you could save money, three, it actually happens, that's the best part. <laughs> um, so I try really hard to schedule those things if I can. Um, and I try to, like we already talked about the CI CD. Okay, there we go. Um, so this is the hardest part of executing a secure system development life cycle is making time. I remember um, I worked at a company that will remain unnamed because it has been in the news with seven major breaches since I quit in protest. I would get emails, there are 2,000 devs and me and my emails, I remember I sing with my boss and she was like, your email just keeps scrolling. And I'm like, those are new emails arriving. And they're just scrolling off the screen. And I'm like, you should see my LinkedIn because the devs have discovered I have a LinkedIn. So they're messaging me there, hoping I'll answer them. We need more help. And she's like, oh, this is so awful. <laughs> I'm like, it's good they want to talk to us, but we need to answer them. So making time for them, this is really highly valuable, but the most difficult thing I'm gonna tell you this whole time. Okay, yes. Okay, so next. So I looked up champions on the internet and I got this, and I love it. And so I like to think of them as like all the developers and the big prize is the secure app. And so I am a big fan of security champions programs. That is where you have one dev from each team who is your person. They answer your questions, they make sure that um, like the information goes back and forth between the security team, you know what they're working on, they alert you as if something's scary, they make sure the security work gets done. This person is the champion of your cause and awesome. And so I want to have like a really complimentary image for those people. They will help you. 
maintain your secure system de development lifecycle. Like, they are like the best. They're a lot of work, but you get to one, make lots of cool new friends that are devs. Two, they get so much work done. And three, they help you scale your program in a way you can't do by yourself. You can't do it with automation. Sometimes you need human beings. Okay, ah, next. So um, I want to have policy and resources and support from upper management for the stuff I'm doing. If they're not on board with what I'm doing, a lot of stuff doesn't get done. Who here has had an AppSec program that's not 100% legit? You get a lot less done. If it's super legit and everything's approved, you get a lot more stuff because you can say, oh, you don't want to do that. So do, do you want me to talk to your boss? Like, what do you want to do here? I don't want to do it. Like, you know you got to do it, so let, what's up? Versus you're just trying to convince them. Um, and then the second part of a secure system development lifecycle is once you release. Because the last part is releasing. And you want it to go out into the world and continue to be safe. And that is where things get more complex. So some people call this shifting right. This is um, a forest in British Columbia. It's a, a rainforest. And the trees are so big, I go like this, and I'm barely like hugging the tree. And so I was pretending that I was strong. Anyway, it's OK. <laughs> um, so I want to secure the, the legacy apps. The moment it gets out into prod, a lot of people will just call it an app, and that's fine. But when does it become legacy? I don't, like the moment you have released it, in my opinion, it goes into this category. So whether you want to call it legacy, you want to call it, I don't know, an app that's live, whatever. But if it's in production, that's when I care about it. If it's no longer in production, that's fine. It's decommissioned. It's cool. But if it's out there live connecting to our systems, I want it to be safe. OK. So this is a weird one. So the first thing I want to do is inventory. This is like really hard, and I don't know why. Or oh, I do know why. Um, but basically, like I worked at a whole bunch of enterprises, governmental organizations. And until quite recently, like specifically 2021, there were no tools that would do inventory of your APIs or your apps that were worth paying more than a penny for. <laughs> like there were ones that would tell you about lots of URLs that you have that are public on the internet, and that's nice. But I'm like, I need to know where all my apps are, who they belong to, who works on them. I need to know all the APIs. Just because there's no front end doesn't mean I don't care. And so taking inventory of all of them, I feel, is the first step whenever you work anywhere. All the things that are already out there, if you don't know about them, you can't secure them. And I know that sounds obvious. So then once you have all the apps, then I want to do triage or take their temperature. So I want to run a scan. So if you have a DAS, a SAS, an SCA, whatever you've got, run a scan on all of them and see which ones are bright red, like the whole report, tons of things. Or, oh, there's like a couple of yellows and it looks OK. Just knowing like that's the danger zone, those ones are like pretty steady, they're looking OK, this is really helpful. An automated tool is not perfect, but it can immediately tell you like this is a disaster and it needs attention immediately. And that's really good. So just to go back, uh, inventory, and then scan everything so you have a picture, just like a quick triage. You can do this, uh, it depends on where you work and what tools you have, but ideally you could do this quickly. And then you can figure out where you're at and then you can go from there. Okay, so we're still preparing. We still haven't even started yet. <laughs> um, so then I wanna purchase any tools that I feel that I need and then I wanna show people how to use them and then if I need to, I wanna create a policy. So policies are, so I used to really hate policies, I thought they were quite stupid. Um, I was like, oh, those are like big long things on the website that everyone mostly ignores. You know, if you follow general common sense, you should be fine. Um, but actually policies can be really helpful, especially if you write them in common plain language people understand. Okay, so then I wanna train my incident response team and the developers when to call me and freak out. So I have worked with many developers where they're like, oh yeah, no, no, just this thing's happening, whatever. I'm like, that's a security incident. May I please help you? Or the incident response team calls me and they're like, oh, this is happening. I'm like, how long has this been happening? Four weeks. Why, why now, why not then? I'm not that mean. I'm, I'm not that mean. Like sometimes I'm a little grouchy, for sure, if like it's the fourth incident in the same day, I could be a grouch, but like, this is my job, please. So I'm really big on showing people like when to come uh, to me and I can help you. And so incidents are serious. We want them to know what they look like and it's okay to call. Okay, so 
now we're going to start. So I like to scan everything. Our scan's perfect. No, they miss stuff. Yes. But I ideally like to do scanning. Oh, and this is like my silly meme scanning, more scanning. Oh my gosh, it's so much scanning. I don't know. This is what Unsplash felt scan continuous looked like. So I was like, okay. Um, but ideally, you want to scan everything quite often and automate it because manual scanning is boring. And then you have a picture of how things are going. You can see, you can gather metrics, see if things are improving, et cetera. So then I want to set up logging, monitoring, and, alert, and if possible, alerting. Alerting is pretty fancy. But if I could log and monitor my apps and my API so I know what's going on, life's way better. Way, way, way better. I feel like uh, I'll know when an incident is in a few minutes or a few hours instead of a few months. Who here has ha found out about an incident like four to six months after the badness? Yeah, yeah I have to put up both hands. Um, yeah, I don't want to know about it. Like, I do also, if that's the only time I can know about it, yes, but ideally earlier. Okay, now, again, this is a hard one. Meet with your security champions. Ask for updates and help them. This is, again, a hard one because it's time consuming and you have to relate to other human beings. And sometimes they're going to ask tough questions like, you made this new policy or you, you, know, you released this new tool and it's like really cramping my style. You're making my job really hard. I need compromise here. But if you compromise with them, life's better. In the long run, for both of you, I have learned. I've learned this the hard way and the easy way, both by like compromising immediately and then also like waiting and fighting about for a long time. And I'm like, oh, it's better that way. OK. So then I want to develop service level agreements for when things should be fixed. Who here has service level agreements for when devs should fix bugs? Yeah. I hope that they're realistic and fair and they're not scary and terrifying and make devs worry they're going to lose their jobs. I want to have a thing where like they're working, they're on it, but I don't want them to feel like, oh my gosh, Tanya's going to come scream at me. I want them to feel encouraged but not terrified. Um, I try to help the developer teams become compliant because some teams are going to have way more than others. Like a few years ago, I was working with this company and this one team had inherited this app that was 38 years old. And at the time, I was 41, and I was like, wow, this app be old. <laughs> they had a lot of bugs <laughs> that had not been scanned before, and it was, yeah. So we had talks, and I helped them become compliant, and we figured out Band-Aids we could put on for a while, and we worked together. I was like, to be clear, no one's losing their job. In fact, if you leave, it will be so terrible for me. Please don't go. We need to work together and make this better. Um, I also like to gather metrics. I'm, I want all my security tools to feed into something. It could be an ASOC tool. It could be, um, it could be like Microsoft Excel. I don't really care as long as it works for you. But what I want is to be able to see if things are getting better or worse or staying the same. And if you're not gathering metrics and there's no way for you to see this data, then you don't know if you're doing a good job. And I talk a lot about data all the time. So there are lots of other top um, talks I've done and uh, like blog articles, et cetera, that's obsessive about this if you want to know more. And I'm trying to keep this to just one slide because I really like data. Okay, next. So we're going to continue to try to maintain our secure apps. Um, I try to support with culture. So I, so I know you're like, oh, she's on stage giving a presentation. She's good at that. I was not good at it when I started. I sucked. It was very bad. Um, I speak both official languages. I'm Canadian. I speak French and English. And I remember giving a presentation in French, and the Francophones asked if I was OK, because I was so nervous. <laughs> and my 45 to 50 minute presentation was done in 12 minutes, because I spoke so fast. And they're just like, she just, she'll be OK. <laughs> so you'll get better at it, and it'll get less scary. And you might not want to do something like this, and that's OK. But being able to get your message across to the people that matter, these software developers, um, whatever way you do it is okay. You don't have to be perfect. You don't have to have a lot of cats in your, it helps though, cats help. But you just want to get the message across earnestly. Okay, next. Um, I think we should do, so I realized that until like last Monday, I sold secure coding training. Um, but I truly believe that we need to show them what we want them to do. I went to college in the 90s. I graduated right when the dot net bubble, or the big bubble burst for web. Um, there was no security course. And when you talk to people now, there's still no secure coding in, in software development, 
in software engineering, in computer science, there's no secure coding course. So I feel we need to teach them, and I also feel we need to remind them what a security incident looks like so they call us instead of trying to handle it themselves and making a disaster. Um, I talk about that a lot too. Uh, if you want to talk about that later, let me know. I'm a big IR nerd. Um, this may sound really obvious, but I like to ask for feedback about how things could be improved. I ask for feedback a lot. I ask a lot like, hey, if anything's like happening or something's weird or it's not working for you, could you please tell me? Because I really want to know. And I can't fix everything. I can't be like, oh, you don't have to fix any bugs, so that's cool. But there's usually a place in the middle that we can meet, right? Or maybe it means I have to redeploy my tools in a different way that works better for you or something else, right? But asking for feedback a lot really, really can help you do your job better and make your team work better with all the other teams. Um, I try to speak at the all staff every year. So if there's a big thing and all the devs will be there, if you could just speak five minutes, like, hi, I'm so-and-so from security. Here are some things we did this year. Here are some things we're planning. We need your help. If you're not on board, we are lost. If you ever need anything, please come see us. We're nice. Um, and wherever else you can think of. Also, again, like carbs work really well. Like if you could give cookies to them, people like snacks. Um, but basically, if you can be visible at the all staff meeting and positive, so not you suck so bad, here's how we screwed up, but positive news, like here's all the cool things we accomplished, here's the things that are coming, here's where you can help. Um, that can go a really long way. I like to perform inventory scans every year, unless you have a tool that does it all the time, in which case you're awesome. Um, but let's say you don't have a giant budget. Previously, I did a lot of AppSec either as a consultant where that means I do not get to decide how the money spent, or I was in the government, which means we had no money to spend. Um, so if I would do this manually, but I need to know about all the apps. I need to know if there was a new API no one told me about. I need to know if we made version two of an API and people forgot to turn off version one. All these things help with inventory. Okay, I'm almost on the slide. I know it's a wall of text, I apologize. Um, I want to look at, so who here does any sort of incident response or helps with incidents at all? Okay, yeah, awesome, you're my people. So every three months or so, and it can be six months, it can be longer, more, whatever works for you, I try to look at all of my postmortems and see, is there something that's repeating? Is there a pattern that I could fix? Is there something I could do to eliminate some of these or make the Passover faster or make the damage less? What can I do to improve this? And if, so incidents are the most expensive, humiliating, damaging way to find a vulnerability or to experience a vulnerability in your apps. So anything you can do to improve this, you're a superstar, right? So I try to look at that. Okay, and then last one. I create and follow up on service level agreements for the really bad apps. So the 38-year-old app, oh, I spent quality time with that team. We talked a lot. I tried to help them with other things. So like we ended up re-architecting the way it was deployed. We put a, a WAF, like we bought a WAF for our customers because I felt so insecure about it being on their sites without extra protection, right? And I was like, I don't care if we're gonna lose 5,000 bucks on this, it is worth it to me to make sure I know they're safe, right? And so follow up with them and make sure the really bad apps are okay and then you can sleep better at night and also less incidents. Okay, so now we've done the really hard part. We've done the comprehensive security. The next parts are short. So be nice to developers, be nice to the business, basically, in summary, but there's a little more, a little more. Okay, so I want developer buy-in. So we're gonna talk about preparing, executing, and maintaining developer buy-in. And this is, this is the way I like to see it. I like to see us being friends, we're colleagues, we work well together. They're like, Tanya helps us secure our apps, not Tanya as a terror. Um, I want you to all not be a terror. I want you to be that person that helps them make better, more awesome software. Okay, so if we want developer buy-in to prepare, I like to give training. Once a year, really big things maybe, like secure coding, and then maybe every month, I talk to them about specific stuff for our org. So although I sold training forever, you know your org better than me. Like custom training that your team built about the problems you truly face has more value than a generic secure coding training. And I know it's bad for business for me to say that, but I don't care. I want, like, if you know we suck at security headers and we need to talk about that, then that's what you should do, right? And so whether it be like, 
monthly or annually, touch base. Um, I like to talk to my security champions regularly, so the, if we're doing the preparing, what we would be doing is building the champions program. We would be attracting and recruiting potential candidates. We would be planning out what we're gonna do with them, finding the right people. Um, and then next, feedback. So I ask people who work there already, okay, so what does our, <laughs> this is so bad, so whenever I start doing secure coding training, I'm like, hey, what's the secure system development life cycle? And the devs are like, we don't have one. And the security team's like, I'm gonna go cry now. Um, and so I want them to all know, oh, well, we like do these things. And then like sometimes we do that, and then when it's special, we do this. And I'm like, awesome. So I want them to know. Uh, so I ask for feedback. I ask them like, what are we doing now? How is it going? What do you like? What do you not like? And that helps inform what we should do next. So now we're gonna execute getting the developers in. So we've asked for feedback. This part means we actually take action on their feedback. I know, crazy, right? Like not only do we ask for it, but we pay attention to it and then maybe adjust our stuff. And so I like to call it connecting. You don't have to call it connecting, but like I'll meet with my security champions once a month and touch base and be like, hey, how's it going? Where are you working on? How's that going? Where are you, what's, what's the next project you're gonna do? Oh, you're doing a new technology, awesome. I'm gonna go read about it so I look smart when we talk next month. <laughs> I like, can I help you with anything? What do you need? Connecting regularly gets you really far. Um, okay, and then sharing. So I try to share all the information that I am allowed to share that doesn't annoy them. So they don't wanna know like every single piece of data that I've collected, but maybe they do wanna know like, hey, you know, we did secure coding training two months ago, and since then, I have seen very few new bugs that was covered in the training. Like, like there were only two. Like, you, like I'm seeing this huge improvement. Rock on, good job. It, sometimes the news is not good. Like, we did this training, and I'm still seeing the same bugs. Like, what's going on? Like, how can I help? Like, clearly that didn't work. That training sucked. Like, what can I do for you to help you get this far? And then lastly, I, I like to recognize, so this is a thing a lot of people miss out. So my first AppSec program, I had zero budget and I had exactly five months till my contract ended and our apps were, I found the OWASP top 10, like the whole thing, all the time. <laughs> like I didn't have one app that had all 10, but they'd have at least five, like it was like. <laughs> um, and so we did this thing where I was like, I want you to scan your app with this tool we bought and fix like highs and mediums, and like if they just did highs, I was pretty pleased. And if they did it, and they came to me, and it was clear they did it, I'd run over, and I'd be like, you passed your scan, and then I'd give them this high five. And we had this open office, and everyone would see the security team giving approval to this devs team. And so the, the, the AppSec high five became this very important thing, and if you're like, I'm not good at high fives, just look at their elbow, and you'll always connect perfectly. You've got it, so you now know the secret to excellent high fives. And like, I, I remember I was talking to like the really, really, really big boss of all the bosses, and I was like, oh, just a second, and I like ran across the room, and then I high five someone, and then I ran back, and he's like, what are you doing? I'm like, AppSec! <laughs> Recognizing people makes them feel good. It's not just for kids. Adults like being known that they're appreciated, and they're doing a great job, and security is usually the bad news bears we can actually do positive reinforcement as well. Okay, so now we want to maintain it. Okay, so communicating regularly. So ideally, if I can join projects, like if you're gonna pick, you're doing proof of concepts because you want to pick a new technology, I want to be there. I would like to help influence you. Oh, cool, thank you for the timing. I, like, I want to communicate regularly. I want to perform consultations like, if I'm gonna write a policy, I want the devs to tell me, yeah, that's actually possible and makes sense. If I have a guideline, I want their feedback all the time. Um, next, measure. So I, I know I said I really like data. When I first did AppSec, it was hard to see that I was doing a good job besides like devs like tolerating my presence. But eventually, when I started measuring things and I could show my boss, like, like we fixed 50 bugs, 50 bugs in prod, this is amazing. Last year we fixed 12. And it's like not even the end of the year, like we can do this. So measuring and then reporting and like sharing it, not just with your bosses, but with the people who did all the hard work. 
Um, another thing that I'm putting in measuring, which maybe doesn't belong there, but I don't care, is um, we try not to point fingers when people do a bad job. Try not to blame people. Often, it's not the person. So like, Fred didn't fix these bugs. Well, Fred probably wasn't like in the pool on like one of those floaty things drinking beers. Fred was probably doing all these other tasks for work that his boss told him he had to do by Friday or else, right? And so if we're like, oh, Fred's the worst, that's, that sucks for Fred when it's often not his fault. There's often like competing things. So try to find the root cause of the thing and blame that instead of the human. Um, okay, so next, don't stop. This is the most important part. Again, remember I said some of them are really hard. Continue to measure, continue to communicate, continue to have positive reinforcement. And that's the hard part is maintaining this and continuing to do the thing, but we can do it. And actually it works just more fun when you do, to be quite blunt. Um, okay, so now we have developer buy-in and now we're gonna do security for the business. And so we want them to like us too and not make them angry. So this is, my friend made this for me, but it was the name of a very famous rich man instead of the security team. So every time you don't use security headers, the security team kicks a puppy. Um, so as you might imagine, this does not work very well. <laughs> um, and so instead, let's be like nicer, <laughs> um, less kicking of poor little tiny puppies. Um, so let's plan stuff that works. And so, like often I'll start somewhere and I'm like, hi, I'm Tanya, like I'm the new person from security. And my friend Nikki, I copy her now, she says, I come in peace. And that really helps if the past security person maybe had some friction. And so I'm like, I wanna know how it's going. I wanna know what you think sucks. I wanna know what you think could be better. I wanna know what you're worried about so that I can help you worry less. It's my job to reduce organizational risk with software generally, right? But I'm here to help, so tell me your problems. And then I listen. So, oh, that's what I just said. Um, then I like to look through like some policies and processes and see if they suck and they can suck less. And like, we're still gonna have to do MFA. I still wanna do that, but we can make it smooth like butter instead of like, uh, 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 like mountain biking. No offense to people that like mountain biking, you're just a lot tougher than me. Um, right, so we wanna make the things easier and smoother and less friction. And so if we review these things, we might find some. And then I ask them what sucks. Like once we've met like a couple times and they're like, she's not so scary, like she smiles all the time, but it's not creepy. Uh, then I'm just like, are there problems I need to fix? Like, could you, could you tell me? And the first time someone gives me one, I'm like, I am going to fix this so good that you're gonna trust me forever. And like, it sounds silly, but I'm like, this is my chance to prove myself. Um, and then from then on, then they tell me more stuff and things go better and better and better. And so this is your opportunity. Um, other, oh, other things. Uh, I already said all those things. Oh, listen, okay. So um, <laughs> people are gonna do what to my app? Um, I like to invite business representatives or product owners to threat modeling. Not everyone likes that. They're like, they don't understand security. I'm like, but I want them to. I wanna ask them what keeps them up at night. So doing this, involving them, listening to their fears and alleviating their fears will get you a lot of buy-in and make your organization more secure. Um, I like to report up. If I'm allowed to give access to a dashboard, I do. I don't wanna scare the pants off them, but I want them to know how it's going and I want them to see improvement. So I try to report up even if they haven't asked. Um, oh, and I tell the story. I interpret the metrics. If you just send them a dashboard and like the number goes up, they're like, oh no, what's happened, right? And maybe it's like, oh, actually we bought like three new tools and we have way more coverage. We used to only scan like half the stuff, now we scan all the stuff. We have a more modern tool set, we can find more. Those bugs were there before, now we just know about them. So it's actually good that number went up. So explain, don't scare the pants off them, you have to explain it. So send the report, but tell them what it means. Not that they're dumb, but just that you have context and you need to share it. Okay, so another thing, tell them when a security project is coming. Tell them in advance. Make it so that when it arrives, everyone's like, we know Tanya told us 37 times. Um, get feedback every time you create a new policy and over communicate these things. Um, that might sound really obvious, that's okay. Um, and then the last one, record when people break a policy and if possible, figure out why and then try to fix it. This might sound really obvious, I am so almost done. I'm really for real, um, okay. So now conclusion. Um, okay, so we learned shifting left's not enough. 
we must be comprehensive and have good coverage. We talked about being nice to software developers. We talked about working with instead of against the business and how we need to shift security everywhere. But more importantly, I want you to have learned that you can do this and that it's actually possible. And it's more than writing a check or checking a box, like it takes work, but we want real change. Like we really, really want this and I especially want you to be a part of this change with me. And um, like I, I actually really, really mean this and that's why I like teach things online for free and why I have a blog and why I write books because you do not make any money when you do that because I really want us all to change the way we do this and the people in this room can help make that happen and I need you to help me because I can't do it by myself. Okay, so please think about that and briefly some free resources and then questions. If I don't get to answer your question here, I will be in the hallway but without high heels on because the carpet is really wobbly um, and I want to look cool and not fall over. So this link will be at the end, but this is a link to the slides so you can just have them right now and you don't have to wait. Waiting is lame. Um, I'm sure that they'll give them to you somewhere else. So um, I have an online community full of free courses and even better, wonderful humans. And we hang out and we do stuff together and teach each other things and all of you are cordially invited. Um, I wrote a book, my mom and I think it's very good. I also love these other books quite a bit <laughs> and they're all about DevOps because I love DevOps. <laughs> um, I have a podcast where I talk with other AppSec nerds and one of my friends, and I was right here, who was on my podcast with me. Um, I have a lot of really awesome people on the podcast that you might want to know about. Um, and then me, I do stuff on the internet a lot and most of the stuff I do is free and I like to write about AppSec and talk about it. And with that, I want to thank Diana Initiative and all of you for having me very much. Oh. And this is the link for the slides. I think, am I allowed one question, Jamie, or am I like totally out of time? Okay, I'm done? Oh, three, I have three minutes, so I'm allowed one question. Who has a question? Also, if you go to the career fair, there's, we had purple stickers there and some TLDR t-shirts and all sorts of stuff. So, yes. Yeah. Yeah, I hear all the time it's not an execution path, right? Yeah. And so people want to downgrade or ignore it or whatever, but anybody can still exploit anything and they have their time and resources, right? So how important is driving for the clarity of the people and for the dolls that aren't there? Okay, so to repeat the question for everyone, so if you're using a component that you know has a vulnerability in it, but you don't know if it's actually like calling the vulnerable part of the code then you're probably not exploitable, like what do we do? Um, so this is gonna be like super biased, but I just started at SEMGREP and they have a tool that tells you if it's exploitable or not and it's free. Um, it's called SEMGREP Supply Chain. And so they made it free like literally three weeks ago. Um, so you should just use that and it'll tell you you are or are not calling it. And then if you're calling it, like you're probably toast. And if you're not calling it, you're probably cool. And then you can make a better decision. So normally I wouldn't say a product on stage, but it's free, so like, yeah. <laughs> um, that's pretty cool. Okay, so, okay, really quick. If Jamie's cool, I'm cool. She's my boss. Oh, that's such a good question. So if you have a whole bunch of results, how do you decide which results you want to fix and which ones you don't? Is that what you mean? Like, prioritization? Yeah, um, so I usually, it depends. So if there are thousands of devs and me, they have to do it, I'm not gonna be able to. But ideally, I work at a place where there's 100 devs, and then there's like 20 teams, or there's 10 teams, and I can actually get to know them, and we can, I know their apps, and I understand, and I'm like, oh yeah, yeah, like that's not public facing, and this and that, and I'm like, yeah, it's probably a lot less scary than the little tool says. Like we're probably, you know, if you could fix it this month, like there's a lot of like informal conversations like that, but you don't always get to work at a place where you're able to know their apps and have time for that conversation to talk about it. But ideally I like to the first time I scan and then if something like new comes up that's kind of scary, it's like, do you guys want to just chat on Slack or whatever? 
And so I spend a lot of my days talking about those things, but it really depends on if you're grossly outnumbered or not. Because if you spend a lot of your time doing that, then the rest of your app program is done. And I am done now. Thank you. Thank you.